You know, I was on Shrapnel Records, and I used to call Mike Verney all the time for stuff just to talk, and just because, well, he was a guy I loved to talk to. He'd play me demos over the phone of new guitarists, and uh, this one night, he played me a demo of this guy who uh, just blew my mind. And I, he goes, you got to listen to this guy. I said, okay. And so he played me over the phone, one of the t- powerhouse demo, and it was amazing. And, um, you know, when I was 10 years old, I, I used to listen to the classical music station, and, uh, yeah, I was a weirdo. And, uh, you know, classical and country were about as hip, and they were about as unhip as anything. So... Um, anyway, I heard this sound on that radio station that I thought was a guitar. And I called the radio station and said, who is the guitarist on that song that you just played? And he said, guitarist? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, that's not a guitar. That's a clavichord. It's a plucked string key instrument, like a piano that plucks the strings. I thought, wow. And I said, hey, whoever can do that on guitar will be the next Jimi Hendrix. And that was in 1970. Well, I heard that sound on the demo that Mike played for me, arpeggios, and I had no idea what they were called, but it was amazing. And I said, you got to get that guy, and you got to bring him here to America because he's going to change the whole sound of guitar. And uh, he'll be really unique until everybody starts copying him. And I was right. So he uh, got Mike, uh, Mike uh, that was like 1982, Mike brought him over, got him into a band called Steeler, and uh, we did a gig with Steeler in Wild Dogs. It was Wild Dogs, Black and Blue, and Steeler with Ron Keel and Rick Fox and and Ingvi on guitar. And uh, my bandmates, if you want to call them that, they they said, you stay here, we're going to go do whatever they did. And so I stayed there and drank the whole case of beer and hung out with Steeler and Ingve and, you know, the really cool guys, man. Just Ingve was really like a super nice guy to me. And I've heard other stories, but I don't have that experience. He was great, man. And uh, he was talking to a lot of magazines that day and I kept coming in and being the comic relief. Anyway, we did the show. And uh, it was a pretty good show, and it was our only time Wild Dogs played in, in L.A., and the place was packed with every guitar player in the world that was in L.A., and uh, the green world room after the show was packed with everybody who was going to be somebody in the 80s. Dio, Wasp, Malice, Rat, Jakey e. Lee was there the day he got the Aussie gig. Steeler gets on stage, and... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I walked around the room watching them and him, and he was amazing. And uh, I keep saying amazing because, uh, well, there's be a, I r- I've run out of descriptions. There were broken dreams and fragile, crashed egos all over that floor, man. And uh, guys standing around watching, which is kind of like the L.A. rocker stance. You go watch a band, like, try to, just press, try to impress me. And uh, sorry, I'm having a problem in my face. And <laughs> not just it's ugly. <laughs> so uh, he's just doing his stuff, and uh, you know the Steeler songs are kind of simple. So he was totally shredding it, uh, you know, just shredding it up, man, and doing all the show stuff. And he was the quintessential rock gu- guitar hero. And uh, <laughs> I just looked around and saw these guys who were like. You could tell they were going to quit, and uh, or they were very disappointed. So uh, the show gets over. We're all backstage, and uh, I was talking to Chris Holmes from Wasp, and I, was, I sat down next to Blackie Lawless and uh, Ronnie James. Actually, Ronnie James Dio was across the way, and my roadie crew said, uh, hey, Dio's over there. Will you see if you can get his autograph? And I said, where? And this guy moved out of the way, and there's a little tiny guy, and I thought, that's Dio? because we hadn't played with him yet. And that voice comes out of that guy? Wow, no problem. He, what's he going to do, bite my ankle? So I go over there, <laughs> and uh, he comes over and sits down, and uh, then Ingrid comes in the room, and um, it was established that night that Ingve Malmsteen was going to be the guy, whether you liked it or not, that was going to change the face, the sound, the shape, and the way rock guitar looked. and Because he was... Like I said, the quintessential rock guitar hero. A real rock star, man, right from the gate. And uh, the demo we, that Mike played me, was I found out that was from 1978, and he played it for me in 1982. It's like, wow. So the guy's been doing this his whole life. And he's only got better and smoother, and people say, he's, oh, he just plays fast. It's like, no, your brain doesn't go fast enough to keep up. Because I've heard him play slow, 
And I've heard him play the most killer blues. The guy is just guitar. After the show, I got in the van with my bandmates, and there was always two vans, the one with a guitar player and a bass player and a sound guy, and then the, the goofy van, that what we call the zoo van with uh, Dean, the drummer, Dean Casanova, and uh, the roadies. And so me and Kip Doran and Taylor Yingling, one of the drum roadies, and Jay from Malice, Jay Reynolds, we went to uh, Ingve's motel room to hang out. In fact, I think Jay might have given him a ride, him and his girlfriend. So we, we go up there, not the whole band, just me, the, well, the people I named. We went into the hotel, motel room and, you know, really, very cordial and friendly. And uh, he was taking apart his guitar. And I had a bunch of questions. So I hear you scallop your own necks. And, you know, he said yes. And he showed me, told me exactly how to do it. I mean, the guy's like, it's like a race car guy. And he's telling you how to, you know, beef up your guitar and, and uh, how he did it. And he took the neck off and said, hold this. And um, I was checking it out. And, wow, it's like, you know, it, it was beat to hell, the guitar was, because he played it. I mean, I've never seen the guy not have a guitar in his hand any time I've ever seen him. Except for once he came out of the bathroom and he didn't have it on then. But that was at a Dio and uh, Rising Force show in 1985. And uh, I'll get to that in the next episode. But uh, we stayed there for like three or four hours and talked. And I mean, it was, he was just like a guy I'd known for forever. Just like somebody, you know, went to high school with and who, uh, you just, he was just cool, man. And the guy just shreds and he can play anything. And Hendrix was a, you know, always a good touch base with everybody I know in guitar and and once we started talking about Hendrix, and just like Lemmy, just boom, it opened the doors, and hey, uh, that was a really fun night. And uh, let's cut this, and I'll come back with another uh, tale from when we played with Talus and uh, Rising Force. Here on U.S. Metal TV, I'm Matt McCourt, a.k.a. Dr. Mastermind. The Ingve Malmsteen, I'm probably not saying that right, because I can't hardly talk. The Ingve Special, 